Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. And if you're new to my channel, hello, my name is Gabby and welcome. So today we're going to be talking about the lipstick killer. So if you have not seen part one, which is where I talk about the lipstick murders, which are the murders themselves, pause this video, go watch that, and then come back to this video. Today we're talking about the killer himself or the person that was convicted of the crimes. We're going to be talking about the supposed evidence that links him to the murders, and we're going to be diving into the theory that he may actually be innocent. So with all that being said, let's just get right into it. Many know him as a serial killer who murdered two women and a young girl before the term serial killer was even a thing. Others know him as William Hirons. A portion of those people who call him by his actual name believe he should better be known as a man who was wrongfully accused of murder back in the 1940s. On June 26, 1946, William Hirons was prowling around the neighborhood where the Dugnans lived and he was looking for a house to rob and police thought it was very suspicious that this man was prowling around this neighborhood where this murder took place not long before so they wanted to bring him in for questioning. He did put up a little bit of a fight so they arrested him and brought him in. William Hirons was 17 years old. He was born on November 15th, 1928 in Evanston, Illinois. The son of George and Margaret Hirons. He committed petty theft since he was a child, but he had no actual history of violence. A larger percentage of serial killers had sometimes twisted and abusive childhoods. As for William, there was really no indication his childhood was that far from normal. He was born a little before the Great Depression, so his family was poverty stricken. His parents did argue a little bit more than they should have, but other than that, there was nothing traumatic to make you think he would have grown up to become a cold-blooded killer. Of course, not every serial killer had a difficult upbringing, but this is something you should take into consideration when thinking about William Hirons. He spent much of his childhood wandering the streets of Chicago, looking for anything to spark a little bit of entertainment. Unfortunately, instead of playing marbles on the corner with the other kids, he went down a path of petty theft. At age 12, he worked at a grocery store and accidentally shorthanded a customer a dollar. To make up for the money, he found an apartment to steal that dollar from. He reached through a crack in a chain door and got that dollar. Apparently, he realized then that it was easier to steal than he thought, or maybe it gave him a sudden rush of adrenaline. Either way, he started stealing larger sums of money and then went on to stealing people's personal items. As time passed and his robbing became more frequent, he accumulated a small collection of people's items. There was everything from handkerchiefs to guns and everything in between. He was quite proud of this little collection that he accumulated over time and he got away with his robbing for about a year's time, a little bit less than a year. First time he was arrested was when he was 13. He was arrested for breaking into an apartment's basement and nothing big came of this arrest, but they did kind of put William in the back of their minds as somebody who was an area nuisance. When William was asked why he did what he did, why he was so obsessed with being a thief and robbing people of their money and personal items, he said that it was basically just a hobby to him. It was something that he enjoyed doing and it got him out of the house and away from his parents arguing. So as you can tell, as a teenager, the thing that probably affected him the most was his parents' tumultuous relationship. Soon after this event, William was sent to a semi-correctional school in Indiana, but it didn't seem to do much because after being released, he was arrested again for theft. Then after that, he was sent to a private institute in central Illinois as recommended by the court. He absolutely excelled in school, receiving some of the highest grades out of any of his fellow classmates. In fact, his grades were so good that at the age of 16, he qualified to take classes at the University of Chicago as a part of the Gifted Students Program. In 1945, at the age of 17, he wanted to become an electrical engineer 
and enrolled in classes to do so. The thing about William Hirons that was a bit confusing to people is he wasn't really a mean-spirited person, he wasn't a bully, he wasn't really a smart mouth to adults. He liked to help others, he was very intelligent, he wasn't somebody that just went around picking fights with people. I'm in no way sticking up for his actions, but he just had this strange addiction to theft. Did this childhood hobby of his, though, turn into something more malicious and gruesome? Was he the person responsible for the lipstick murders? Or was he an innocent man who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and was arrested for it? At the time of his arrest, like I was discussing before, he was a student at the University of Chicago. Like many people agree, he was known as a problem child, but he definitely wasn't someone you would expect to commit a murder, especially one as heinous as Suzanne Degnan's. Although he had no previous history of violence, it was said that he did pull a gun out on a police officer when they were trying to catch him. Like I said before, the next place he was going to rob just so happened to be in the same neighborhood as the Degnan residence. So police arrested him and brought him in. Three days after his arrest, police announced to the public that they found William Hiron's fingerprints on the Degnan ransom note. Again, for what it seems to be like the millionth time, police tell the public that they found the lipstick killer finally, and it's ran on the front page of pretty much every newspaper in the area. Then they made William write out what was written in the ransom note on a piece of paper. The top handwriting is how William wrote the first line of the ransom note as directed by authorities. The bottom is how the killer wrote the first line of the actual ransom note. To me and many others, it's quite obvious that they look very different. But to authorities, they claimed his handwriting matched the killer's. While he is in custody, authorities question him and give him sodium pentothal. Sodium pentothal is a rapid onset, short acting barbiturate general anesthetic. Most know it as a so-called truth serum. You take it and apparently for a short period of time, you can only tell the truth. It was used often back in the day during questioning. The transcripts from the questioning were not then released to the public. The only thing police told the newspapers is that the outcome was miraculous. By the 1950s though, most scientists believed any information collected from an individual after taking the serum was completely invalid information. When William was arrested and questioned back in 1946, scientists' opinions on it had not yet affected the courts or police departments. About two weeks after his arrest, police told the public that not only were William Hiron's fingerprints found on the ransom note, they were also found on the door jam of Francis Brown's apartment. After about a month in custody, he makes a full confession for the murders of Josephine Ross, Francis Brown, and Suzanne Degnan. At this point, the transcripts from the questioning were released to the public, and most of his answers were very short, and he insisted most of the time that he didn't have anything to do with it and that he knew nothing about the murders other than what he read from the newspapers or while talking to police while in custody. After he finally confessed though, he took a plea bargain because he confessed. This meant he would spend three consecutive life sentences behind bars instead of going off to the electric chair. After the confession though, he continued saying that he never did it, he never committed the murders, he only confessed to them because he had no other choice. His confession was enough for authorities. The actual case was never taken to court. He was just sent away to prison. When asked about it years later, William Hiron said he buckled under the pressure and went where they wanted him to go. He claimed he only admitted to the crimes to save himself from the death penalty, which he knew he would get if the case was taken to court. He described his younger self as a kid who just liked to look for unlocked apartments, not a murderer. He said even his lawyers were pressuring him to just confess. When William was asked how he ended up in the Degnan neighborhood, he said it was basically just at random and he was looking for a house to rob because he had an upcoming date with a young girl and he didn't have any money. So he decided to do what he did best and he was going to rob a home of not their belongings this time, but money. The first week that William was in custody, he was basically given 
barely any food, barely any water, and he wasn't even allowed to speak to his lawyer. The only thing that he was really allowed to do was go to the jail hospital for his head injury. He got a head injury because while he was being arrested, there was a bit of a resistance going on, and one of the officers took a pot that was used for planting, and they broke it over his head. When William was asked how being in custody was, he said it was basically complete hell. He was barely allowed to sleep. They were questioning him constantly and shooting him up with this truth drug. And they even gave him a spinal tap that gave him horrible, horrible headaches for a long period of time afterwards. I'm sure everybody's probably wondering if they gave William Hirons a polygraph test. They did, and authorities said the results were inconclusive, but when people looked over the results years later, they said that the results were not inconclusive, that they were the results of an innocent man. Not many people wanted to listen through the years to his side of the story. One person who did though was a woman named Dolores Kennedy. In 1986, Dolores was a legal secretary in the area. Her father was an attorney who had met William and was certain he was innocent and wanted to represent him in court so he could possibly win parole. Dolores' father passed away before he ever got to represent him in court, but Dolores still wanted to meet William herself. So she did. By the time she met him in person, he was actually one of the most accomplished inmates out of all of Illinois. He was actually the first prisoner in all of Illinois to receive a college degree, and he spent most of his time in prison learning anything he could. He received so many certificates. He was definitely a model prisoner. He spent much of his time in the library in the prison, learning all he could about mostly the judicial system. He wanted to absorb as much information from these books as he could, so he would better know how to represent himself in court so he could eventually gain parole. Because he was so knowledgeable in this topic, he was basically the guy that every other inmate, when they had an upcoming court date, they would go to him to try to learn what they should say in court and how they should go about it. And he really liked helping people in this way. After hearing his side, Dolores told William he should write a book. Tell what happened back in 1946, all the things that weren't ran in the newspaper. She had experience as a journalist, so she decided to take on the project. And the book, William Hirons, His Day in Court, was published in 1991. This book interested people and also changed many opinions. The point of the book was to tell how he simply may have just been a scapegoat. The main cold hard evidence when it comes to this case that linked William Hirons to the murders were his fingerprints, like I mentioned before. Very suspicious, but when it came to the ransom note, before William Hirons was arrested, police said that there were no fingerprints on the ransom note. After he was arrested, they said that they found his fingerprints on the ransom note. When asked how many fingerprints there were on the ransom note, authorities said that there were not only one, but there were two of his fingerprints on the ransom note. Then, years later when they were asked about it, they said that there was also one of his fingerprints on the back of the note, like it almost just appeared there. So according to the timeline, authorities said at the beginning that there were no fingerprints found anywhere, then they said that they found two on the ransom note, and then they found another one on the ransom note, and then they said that they found his fingerprint on the door jam in Francis Brown's apartment. Here's what is weird. Dolores worked with Hiron's attorney, and they sent these fingerprints off to a retired fingerprint specialist. In all his years, he had never seen anything like it. As everyone knows, when police take your fingerprints, you put your finger in ink, put it on paper, and roll your finger on the paper so you can get the entire print from right to left. That is exactly how William's fingerprints were on the ransom note and the door jam almost like they literally took his fingerprints on file and put them there. If you really wanted to take William Hirons' fingerprint and put it somewhere and frame him, all you would have to do was, according to his attorney, take a little piece of cellophane tape, put it to his fingerprint on file, and then put it wherever you want. The next bit of evidence, or supposed evidence, is the handwriting. Authority said back then that his handwriting matched the killer's handwriting pretty much to a T. Now, 
Every single handwriting specialist that has looked at his handwriting compared to the killer's said that they were not the same person. I also have to mention that a lot of people through the years wanted to look back on William Hiram's case files and see if they could do anything else. Coincidentally, most of his case files were either lost or destroyed. William Hiram spent his later years from 1998 until his death in the Dixon Correctional Center under minimum security. In 2001, Lawrence C. Marshall filed a petition to seek clemency for William. It was denied. July 26, 2007 was William's last parole hearing, and he again was denied parole with a 14 against zero vote. On March 5, 2012, over a week after being taken to the University of Illinois Medical Center, William Hirons passed away at the age of 83 after a long battle with diabetes. He is Chicago's longest serving prisoner, serving over 65 years. Most lawyers in today's time, if not all lawyers who look at this case, say that it is the definition of a wrongful conviction. That all the information that I presented to you guys in today's video would never stand up in court in today's time. Obviously, he was a thief. That's nothing you're going to stand up for. But stealing people's personal items and money, even though you should never do that, is very different than beheading a six-year-old little girl. If William Hirons was actually innocent and he never committed these murders or any of them, the lipstick killer was never actually caught. I read through all the comments on part one and a large portion of people said the exact same thing that I was thinking, but I didn't really wanna dive into it in the first video. And that is that Suzanne's murder is very different from Josephine and Francis's. Josephine and Francis, they were both women and they were found at the crime scene. Their bodies were there to be found. Suzanne, she was a little girl, she was not a woman and her body was dismembered and spread around the area. These murders are very different from each other and the only thing that really connects them is the handwriting that to me does kind of look different. The handwriting on the ransom note and the handwriting on the wall look a bit different. They are a little bit of the same style, but it's almost like the person that wrote both of them just didn't want to use their actual handwriting, which is quite common when it comes to killers. A huge part of me believes that authorities just wanted to group these three people together so they didn't have to look for multiple killers. I also have to mention a fact about this case that is quite interesting, and that is that if you're familiar with the Black Dahlia case, chances are you know who Steve Hodell is, the retired Los Angeles police officer who has convinced his father, George Hodell, is the killer of the Black Dahlia. Well, he had actually met William in 2003 and was fully convinced that he was innocent of all three murders, even writing an appeal to the Illinois Prisoner Review Board. A lot of people who have looked into this case and are still looking into this case, whether they worked on the case or they're just researching it for fun in their spare time, basically most of them agree that this man was innocent. That police were not really worried about trying to find the lipstick killer. They were trying to find somebody that they could pin these murders on so everybody would be happy that they were finally solved. I try to be as unbiased as possible when it comes to the cases that I present on my channel. I've given you guys all the information when it comes to this case and I wanna know your opinions down below in the comments. After finishing part one and part two, what do you think? Do you think the handwriting on the wall and lipstick and the handwriting on the ransom note were done by the same person? Do you think the same person killed all three victims? Do you think that William Hirons is innocent? Let me know your thoughts, and with all that being said, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye, guys.